now it's ready, see? Okay. Let's do it. Okay. From where I stop. From when now.
Tetrarch of Ben Shiva, Great Hamad Chacham, of the deep relationship, the history, the Philip and Ertz Yisrael, and Lashon Kodesh. You always had such tremendous respect for your older brother Chaim Beryl, the Valda Seif, and you slept into Baranovich when, when your father was busy making the wherewithal and arranging visas that eventually saved your whole family. You would walk from Arzevira to Rechavia for kilometers every Shabbos to visit him, and you would sit and receive from him what your brother wanted to give. And I learned from this what it means to keep it out, it's also for an older brother, what it means to give COVID to somebody, not only keep it out and so on. It's, it's not about you, it's not what your agenda is that you want to come to them in order to get this or that to benefit from. COVID that you gave was that you were there for them to give to you what they wanted to give. And this was something that was very important for us in every relationship of when you want to give COVID to a person. We know that the Silas Yisharim left such a very, very deep impression on you. You're always walking around searching for meaning. The beer of Klaal, Chayus Adam by Lomoy, the headline of the Parak Aleph that we were able to learn in hospital less than 24, years, 24 hours ago. All your children and we were sitting around and, and learning it because this was such a, an eager part of who, who you were. And this was always, always at the forefront of everything. You were always walking around. What, what is it about? What's the meaning? Why am I here? This little, whatever action I'm doing, what is it about? And this very, very deeply affected us. And hopefully we can incorporate it. And not only, not only just as like a, a, a like people would say a muster, muster in the sense of the chaytus of us. It's a deep thing that you have to always analyze and think about. It's as important as any other study. My sister came to visit, Malkala came to visit you a few months ago. And she, even though you weren't completely the way you always were, she just started. She said, "You saw it, and you continued." Even when you could barely say anything else, this is what you were able to say. So you were a, a deep philosopher. You're always concerned with trying to find a meaning, but it wasn't it wasn't just about the intellect. You were born in Nissan. You loved. Nature in the spring, you would always point out when we walk on the street the buds of the trees in, in the spring. You were the spoil from, you, you, you were a refugee, and for three and a half years you were a prisoner in a camp in the Japanese and the Philippines. You had to build, you always built with your hands, and, and you were always been spoiled that the hut that you built from bamboo grew in the rain, and it grew buds. But you have to sit, it, and, and for you, it was all all part of the same thing. You were like maybe like your own father. I know in the Sefer and in the Shefer, I read that he was talking about everybody knows Masik Gudi Mudai, Manoa Dilonzev is Chayiv Benafsha. People ask why, and and he's writing here. He was also your father, and spoiled from nature in that way. That if you think of nature and Manoa Dilonzev as a separate thing from Tyra, so then there was Chayiv Benafsha. You have to see it as an integral, and it was an integral part for you. It, was, it wasn't a contradiction. The Machai Bosa by Lamai, and to, to look at the buds of a tree and to be misspoiled from it, it's the same thing. And we benefited from that, and we grew up with that, and all, all the children are like that a little bit because of you. And I know that you got some of it from your father here, it was passing down in the cider. Again, you didn't teach this to us, this was your unhugger, and we. We, we learned from your mother. I remember you said about Rebbe Mechab and Ashirim, another strange thing that was Rebbe Mechab and Ashirim. And you explained it to me. You said, you know, I'm not exactly saying your words, maybe, so I'm sorry about that, but 
basically, if there's an usher and he gives you a nadav, he builds something for you, so you can cover it, it's easy, right? It's a good exchange. But if it's not a person, an usher, didn't give you anything. Rabbi was an usher, so what's he did? He sent anything from, from, from an usher. So what does it mean, Mechab and Asher? The thing is, you have to give everybody what they need. You have to look at a person, and it's not your ego and your agenda, and say, what does this person need from me? What can I give to them? If he's a poor person, it's easy to give him money. But what if he's an usher? What, do you, what can you possibly give him? The answer is maybe the person needs some covet. He didn't give you anything, you don't have to give him covet. But you look at him and you forgive him, and you say, this is a person who needs covet. He's a thousand times richer than me, he needs covet. I'm not getting anything, it doesn't matter. It's not about me. You give covet. <laughs> you never were thinking about yourself. I remember just in the house, you're sitting in the living room, my mother's in the kitchen, mommy's in the kitchen, and she just was looking for potatoes. She said something like, oh, we don't have potatoes. Oh, okay, I'll make it without potatoes. And I could see a sudden movement from the living room, meters away, many meters away, and the door suddenly closes. Ten minutes later, you come with big bags of potatoes. It's a zrizis, it's a pickle, it's a... You just were... It wasn't about you. And we, after learning the Sils Yishari and Shabbos, we understand that all these little things, even the zrizis, everything is unacquitted. As a young child growing up in Montreal, we went to a shul, regular uh, shul, different times we went to a shul, and it was in those days there weren't uh, such things so many, you were helping build it up. And I, it made such a deep impression always that you would happen with Kavoda, the people talking, the people, all kinds of things happening, and you would just, you wouldn't criticize anybody, you weren't there to tell people what to do, you did what you did, and that's the best way for us to learn. He never told us, he didn't lecture us, he didn't muster us, that we should do it. Nah, we'll come this is what you did, and it made a very, very deep impression. And again, Mr. Sushar, you know, what is avoid the Masha, what the version call it says, it's not just avoid it, it has to be with Rosh Hashanah. In Rosh Hashanah, we remember, he wouldn't be speaking at the table, it wasn't like a doctor, and so on, it was like a Real and and this Hanhaga was in, in everything a, a, a yasha, it's an attempt to be yasha, and that was perfect. You always try for yasha. I remember there was a fire in our apartment building in Montreal, and the insurance adjuster came, and he, you know, was from the insurance company. He's not there; they're not looking to give up money, but he saw all the fire and the smell of smoke and covered with soot. And, you know, if the pages were a little warped, and he said, oh, look at all these books, I understand these are religious books, it would be thousands of dollars, we're going to reimburse you, we're going to buy them all more. And he says, what are you talking about, I have these books, I can read it, he starts pulling it out and shaking it up and saying, look, it's perfectly fine, I can, I can read it still, there's no need. And, and, and the man was perplexed, he probably never encountered such a thing, whether it was a client just pushing away the reimbursement. But he, this was always his attempt at Yashas. I remember when we visited Eretz Yisrael the first time, and it was after 67, and they were building. We came back with such a stylus that they're building in Yerushalayim, and they're building, 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 they're building everywhere, and made you want to come here, and you wanted to be part of it. And in fact, when you came, when you made, you came to Yerushalayim. You ended up working in a very simple, it was like, oh, we, we suffered a little bit, we were feeling like it's not the company, which is really, I know, we were involved with different things. Uh, it wasn't with your hands exactly, but, you know, we thought you'll come here, you know, she was something like that, and you had to offer us, and you wanted to be Boine Yerushalayim, Yuvamish, Boine Yerushalayim, it meant so much to you, Boine Yerushalayim. We spoke to the people here at work, the, 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 the people, very, very much the people. Everybody to you is a human being of dignity. Everybody who is gracious understands what is it a human, a human being, that they, with dignity, what is the essence of a human being. And this was you always about not helping positive. You walked around always.
always talking about gracious and other Mardushkin and Eitz Adas. If somebody would just, if somebody would just follow you around and, and hear what you're talking if yourself, thinking, it, it would be over and over. And then your children have the same, uh, I don't call it an obsession, what is it all about? What is it all about? You always said it. In the last months, when you weren't speaking full senses and wasn't always clear, over and over again, And it wasn't only gracious, all the parshas, you lived the parshas and, and the three children, and also we lived the parshas. You were troubled by everything that happened. You didn't take anything for granted. Yan lay mountain be like shame, you were disturbed, like how could it be? You came back from shul and you were like, you were like, oh, you're like, what, what, how could it be? What, what, why, what? It wasn't just like leading the parsha in the shul. It's, this was who you, who you were, and, and it made an impression on us. And, You went through all kinds of, you left, you ran away with the, with the Mir Yeshiva and you ended up in Japan for a few months and then they shipped everybody over to the part of China that they conquered, Shanghai. And you ended up on the way to America, you were captured by the Japanese in the Philippines and interned by them in a prison camp for three and a half years and there was no food, there was all kinds of ploys, all kinds of misyonists. You have to count the grains of rice, how many you'll have each day. And you learned, you learned your Gemara, you had along with your Gemara and the Tanakh. And the Torah, it says, You were spoiled from the, the people that you met there, not the necessarily just the ordinary Jewish, non Jewish people. And spoiled from their chokhmah engineers and how they took care of the whole camp, the mm -hmm. prison camp. But it was always chokhmah of and you were spoiled with chokhmah of But you kept and you, with such self-sacrifice, and you kept kashers at least as long as there was actual food. In fact, there was another prisoner who was asking, can we eat this food? We're starving, can we eat the food? And he said, you're starving, of course you have to eat this food. And then this person saw that he's not eating it. And he says, what, what is this? He says, I don't have anybody to ask. And Rapatsko told him, he says, that you're a kind of, why you've been saying? And we know it's all, all of this life is a prozer. And again, we're supposed to show him. There's all things in the world that are constantly fighting against you to prevent you from doing Chagosar Golomai. And it's all in the Siyonis. And Oymid bin Asayin in this way taught us a lot. And again, you never lectured us about this. You never told us that we should be like this. You, this is who you were. And, and that was the strongest way that you could convey all this to us. Yeah. 